IO9 presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 38 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Hi, this is John Joseph Adams. I'm the editor of several anthologies, such as Brave New Worlds and The Way of the Wizard. I also edit Fantasy Magazine and Lightspeed Magazine. And uh, the first year of Lightspeed Magazine is going to be collected all into an anthology, uh, which comes out in November. It's called Lightspeed Year One. And I'm David barr I'm the author of many short stories, including The Ontological Factor, about a nervous philosophy student who finds himself in a house full of doorways to other worlds. The story will be appearing in the September-October issue of Cicada Magazine. And our guest today is Ken Denmead. He's the editor of the Geek Dad blog on Wired.com and is the author of the best-selling book Geek Dad, awesomely geeky projects for dads and kids to share. He's followed that up with two more Geek Dad books, The Geek Dad's Guide to Weekend Fun, which just came out, and the upcoming The Geek Dad's Book for Aspiring Mad Scientists, which focuses on science fair projects. Okay, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Ken Denmead. Uh, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Okay, so first question, uh, were you born a geek or did something happen in your life to set you on that path? Well, you know, it, it's a tough question. I, I think the uh, the genes were there. Um, my father's an engineer. My, uh, I had a grandfather who was a physicist. And um, so, you, you know, the, the at least on one chromosome, <laughs> The, uh, the that that techie math bent was there, but um, I definitely think the the trigger event, as it were, uh, was somewhere about I'm not sure about first or second grade. My uncle Doug gave me an original D and D box set, and that was a huge deal to me. And so I think that that started me on the path, and. Uh, so many other awesome things you know i was i was in that elementary school late elementary school era when star wars came out and all the other uh, seminal science fiction stuff that happened in the 70s so yeah i used to come home from school every day and here in the bay area um 6 p.m they were running reruns of star trek original series every night so i caught you know i, I watched Star Trek over and over and over again. The uh, uh, probably I think the the geekiest expression of of uh, of my geekdom was for a number of years. I actually ran a play by mail Star Trek RPG. Okay, so uh, how'd you get involved with the Geek Dad blog? Uh, Geek Dad is is. Uh, it was, is, and continues to be an amazing uh, experience and and has utterly changed my life. Chris Anderson actually started it. He was the uh, editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. And he had started off with a, a handful of people that he knew either from the magazine or the sort of uh, tech, uh, cool tech people in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was running like a post or two a week tops, not not a lot. It was mostly projects that these folks uh, wanted to share that they were doing with their kids, which was which was really cool. Then sort of come around March, I think, of, of 07, Chris puts out sort of a general call. He wants to get you know a batch of writers from around the country to just sort of build up some content and get something going and represent some different points of views. And um, one of the things, you know, so I I took a shot at it. I mean, it was like nothing, I'd I'd never specifically done blogging. I always considered myself a decent writer, but it just, it really interested to me. And I, I sort of took the point of view that if I didn't try it, or if I didn't at least submit and go, you know, take a shot at it, that I would just kick myself in the butt for for the rest of my life for not having taken the shot. So I went ahead and did it, and in like you know the, my my strongest online writing cred was yeah I was running this Star Trek play by <laughs> email RPG and I I just I just thought there was no chance in heck that I was going to get this, especially because he had literally very specifically said when he put out the call that he wasn't really looking for people in the Bay Area because he already had a number of people there. And whatever combination of stuff you know clicked, 
he he I was one of the team of about it was a dozen to sixteen um people that got brought on that time around. And I just like I saw that as the best opportunity because I mean, you know, because it's a blog at Wired magazine, part of part of Wired's online presence. So you're writing there, you you really do sort of get to say you write for Wired. It, you know, it's a little a little white lie or not. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's that we, you know, our stuff goes through the blog stream on their front page and all that. So it's so yeah, you're you're part of that environment, that family. And I just I went to town. I was like, all right, this is my creative outlet. This is my my chance to to just sort of express all the stuff that I'm going through and feeling. And as a as a parent, as a geek, all the all the great pop culture stuff that's coming up for us. And I st- I was posting every single day. I like I for the next few months I was just I was a writing machine. And l- sort of later on in that year, I had you know, my, my my sort of next thing was okay. We're doing I'm doing this blog. It's so much fun. Um, at that time, you had to have a podcast if you were going to be a successful blog. You had to have a podcast. So I pitched a podcast to Chris, and he said that's a great idea. Go off and go off and do me a demo. I found a couple of the other guys, um, and we threw together. I had actually been doing a podcast for the Star Trek group for like two years. And, you know, huge, gigantic subscription listening audience of about 25, 30 <laughs> people. Um, but we had a ton of fun with it. So, you know, I'd already figured out the tech part of it, and I'd already sort of um, stolen or aped all of the, the presentation style from other podcasts that I listened to, especially like uh, like Leo Laporte's uh, This Week in Tech and all of those podcasts. It was just like, I just just, just do it like Leo, and I can't, you know, I won't, I won't go too wrong. So I put together a, a demo for Chris. Um, Chris liked it. He had, a, had a, a, a couple of notes. We went ahead and did a first formal official one. And, in, and I just remember this one email. He said, you know what? It sounds great. Go ahead and get it running. Oh, and by the way, I'm, you know, this is getting a little too busy for me. Do you want to take over? <laughs> and I moved into being editor of Geek Dad. And it has, it, that, that thing has changed just about almost all of my not quite all my life, but all, most of my life, um, you know, we when we, when we started there, it was like seventy to eighty thousand paid views a month. Now we regularly hit a million plus, and was able to slowly sort of uh, you know wheedle some money out of Wired. Since as we built up page views, obviously they noticed us. They they've actually started to be able to sell ads against us specifically, and so we started getting a little money out of them, and I'm able to pay my people and such. And um, so that all just had worked very smoothly and, and slowly built and built and built and, and was a good ride. And then I get an email and it says, hi, I work for a literary agent. We're interested in talking to you about putting together a book proposal and representing you. <laughs> and, you know, that's the, your, your first, you know, and anyone experienced life on the Internet, your first uh, your first response to that is, yeah, right. Thank you, Mr. Nigerian Scammer, and we'll have a nice day. But, you know, the, the, the email address, the company that came from, you know, quickly researched them, and, and they were completely legit and even had very – had good cred. And so I responded to them, and lo and behold, yes, it was an entirely – above the board and I worked with them. We put together a, a proposal, you know, a book proposal based on geeky projects for parents and kids to share together. And they put it out on the market and it got, and it got picked up by Penguin and the first geek dad book was on the market a year later. Uh, So what have been uh, some of the most popular projects from the books? Uh, Probably the one that's gotten the most attention at, uh, from from book number one was uh, sort of your so many people professors and and so many people have sort of struck out and done the uh, whole get a weather balloon and launch the camera up into space project, which is really cool, but basically you know, a little more ambitious than than uh, you know I've got time to do on the weekend with the kids, and so I sort of sort of came up with the the uh, the light version of that, which was get a couple of of uh, party tanks of helium and 
blow up a bunch of balloons and take like a flip digital camera, you tether tether the whole thing with kite string and you launch your camera up on balloons, you know, you can get it up three or 400 feet, but it's still going to be amazing footage, just sort of like looking over your town or whatever. And that one, that one got a lot of attention in the first book and up until the point that um, I got interviewed on NPR Science Friday and they took their they actually went out their film their their sort of media crew went out and did it off of you know a a, a, a rooftop in Brooklyn and launched it launched the camera and got some really fun footage that was that was really neat um, the new book that just actually just came out like three and a half weeks ago um, the project the, the one project I, I like to highlight be just because of its simplicity and it's like slap slap up the forehead kind of kind of wow that works so well just having discovered it was the Nerf blowgun, the <laughs> Nerf dart blowgun. And I was just, you know, I was just looking, trying to come up with some projects for the new book and knew that I wanted to do something with Nerf darts because we are a total Nerf head family. We, you know, every, you know, my wife, myself, my kids, my in-laws we all have Nerf guns. And we will have, you know, if we go, if we go visit them on the, over a holiday or something, we will take the Nerf guns with us and we will have a huge Nerf battle in their house. So there's always darts lying around. So I wanted to do something with shooting Nerf darts, but that would be something you could build yourself rather than, rather than either hacking the guns or, or something like that. And um, our next door neighbors happen to own the hardware store in town. So I literally took, you know, a batch of darts and just went over to their store and was just looking around for something, something that would work. And I fixated on um, half-inch copper pipe, the, the kind of water pipe that you use, you use for uh, water lines in your house. And I you know, put the dart in, and it was like, oh, the diameter works really well. This is awesome. And so I'm standing on one side of the store, put the dart in, and you know, just like classic uh, spitball shot, I, I blow the dart in the, in the, in the, in the blowgun. And it shoots all the way across the store, <laughs> like like thirty yards, like <laughs> perfect arc hits the back wall of the store, and I, I, I like okay, that's a win, <laughs> right there. It was like, I mean, it shoots. I have not seen uh, maybe the long strike, but I have not seen any other of the Nerf guns that we have in our family actually able to shoot as far as this silly blowgun works. Uh, could you talk about some of the other people who contributed ideas or uh, material for this book? Absolutely. But, you know, first of all, um, awesome help from a number of the writers at Geek Dad. Um, I would not have been able to put this together without their help in sort of submitting project ideas to me and, and uh, helping, me, uh, helping me flesh some of the thoughts out. Um, what was also really cool was for this second book, just just because of the the place that the blog has gotten to in terms of notoriety at least within the uh, the geek community I was able to get some some cool sort of geek celebrities to to add little pieces to the book like um John Kavalik who who you know the the artist for all of the Munchkin card game and creator of the Dark Tower comic and stuff like that he let me print his uh his recipe for the ultimate gamer geek uh food stuff which he <laughs> calls igor bars which is this amazing concoction of uh like a cookie dough and caramel and rice crispy treats and chocolate i got um ken jennings the uh the jeopardy champion <laughs> gave me a project about photoshopping his kids into uh, lego kits um, I got a, a lovely little short piece from Rod Roddenberry, son of son of Gene, son of son of Mister Star Trek, um, about just you know enjoying going on car rides with his dad when he was really young, which is just really cool. Uh, so you were quoted by both the New York Times and the Washington Post in connection with the Balloon Boy hoax. Uh, can you tell us about that? So the, the yeah the Balloon Boy hoax. Uh, I, I I found it funny that. That our little blog and and me in particular sort of got got to be uh, uh, got quoted on that, but I know it was funny because it was almost like the the OJ slow chase. <laughs> we were all watching this balloon boy thing going on the air, uh, you know, live being streamed via CNN or whatever, and 
I forget where I was, but I had I was at my computer and and probably Twitter was on or whatever, and everyone's talking about this, and I'm watching this, and you know it's occurring. You know the, the question was there: Is the kid there? Is the kid not there? And I had you know I've dealt enough with balloon stuff, and I'm looking at this. You know it it was a, a mylar type balloon, too, and you saw how it was being sort of misshapen just by the wind currents. So it wasn't even full. And understanding what the, you know, what's the lift capacity of helium, it's good, but it's not that good. And so I was I just very quickly, you know, with, with both just an attempt at being, you know, pl- putting a little scientific skepticism into the discourse as well as, you know, just hoping to get a little attention for our blog was, it was like, no, he's not in there. I mean, look at the balloon. It's 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 not big enough. And and I just did some really quick, you know, back of the napkin calculations about lift capacity and the approximate apparent volume of the thing. I said, no, there, there's no kid in there. <laughs> and boom, got nailed that one. And um, it was cool. It, it's just so funny that okay, our little geeky blog of you know, you know what was no one else looking at it the same way? Why it was it was like no one wanted to watch that. With a critical eye. Well, and that does seem to be sort of an endemic problem in kind of major media, a sort of just lack of basic kind of skeptical thinking and critical thinking and stuff. Do you think that that's just sort of inevitable or do you think that like a geek dad type coverage of things might become the mainstream, um, you know, in a few years? Oh, that would be lovely. Sure. Um, Obviously, you know, first, without hopefully offending three quarters of the population of the planet, um, (laughs) Pop culture is pop culture, and what is popular as news is what the population likes and is often not the most rigorously studied, vetted, or, you know, explained to a, to a high level of, you know, mathematical precision. And the fact that we have the Internet now and nearly instantaneous communication to the point that even if someone says something really stupid, a hundred pedants will stand <laughs> up and point out how wrong they are and overwhelm them in a minute. And so I think, you know, the the the, the tiny little voice of reason and skepticism that I represented on the day that the you know the balloon hoax was going up is is more a positive symptom of the small but hopefully growing population of people on the internet that have the ability to um, say, um, wait a minute, hold on, can I point this out that this doesn't make sense? And actually, you know, that can be as viral as any, you know, balloon hoax. Um, okay, so uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, moonbots.org? We're, we have uh, been able to foster a really cool relationship with Lego over the last few years. Actually, you know, Chris Anderson, founder of, or you know, ed, founder of Geek Dad and editor in chief at Wired, um, was I believe he was on the like an advisory board for Lego Mindstorms, and because of that relationship, I've gotten to know pretty well um, one of the one of the sort of senior community managers and highfalutes at, at Mindstorms and uh, they've always been really good to us getting us kits and stuff for giveaways and things like that and he had had this idea his name is Steven had had this idea about doing some sort of giveaway contest project related thing that would go on in the uh, in the months that were sort of like after the big first robotics competitions and all those championships happened. So it'd be sort of like the, the off season for the, for all the robot teams out there, give them something to do. And we would um, develop a challenge where teams would need to build robots out of Mindstorms kits that would fulfill certain sets of tasks that would mimic what the, uh, what lunar or the, what the Mars rovers were doing to spark the imagination and get school teams or community teams doing something really cool together. And so it started out with just two of us. And then through connections and stuff, we got um, Google involved and we got the uh, Lunar X prize uh, guys involved. And it sort of, sort of ballooned out of there and became this really awesome 
gigantic uh, uh, challenge. And I, I believe the registrations are on right now for the second go around of Moonbots. And if folks want to like, you know, put together uh, teams, I think there needs to be one adult on each team, and then a number of kids can be on it. And uh, go go check it out. It's at moonbots.org. Uh, so, what are some of the best strategies for getting your kids to adopt geeky interests? You know, that's a, a that's a question I get a lot, and it's actually something I address in uh, in the most recent book. Um, my strategy is not to push. Just do what you love, and sooner or later your kids are going to get jealous and ask to join you. Because if you're having fun, they're going to want to have fun too, and they're going to ask to do it. My, my, my anecdote about it is for a number of years I was trying to get my kids to play D&D. I thought they'd gotten to the age where, you know, at the age or a little bit later than when I had first taken up the game, and I thought – this would be awesome. I go, come on, boys. You know, you get to play warriors. You get to play magic users and thieves and do great adventures and fight monsters. And, and they were all like, eh, whatever, Dad. <laughs> eh. And so, uh, like, one week, I had just picked up the new, a new player's handbook. And I just left it out somewhere. I think it was on the, the island in the kitchen. And it just left, got sat there for a couple of days. And then I'm off doing something one day and my older son comes by and he's got the player's handbook in his hand and he's been leafing through it. And he goes, dad, this looks really cool. Could, could we play this sometime? Um, I mean, so, you know, young geeks are often treated badly by their peers. Is that something that you worry about when raising your kids to be geeks? Um, I, tr I just try to make them aware of what the possibilities are. I mean, it, I think there's less of that these days than there was in the past, just with how geek culture has come to something of the forefront of popular culture. So it's not quite as bad as it used to be. But obviously it's still there. And and the most important thing is always keeping you know the balance or keeping communication lines open with your kids and making sure they understand that you know if you're having trouble in school, how to deal with that. And hopefully in a positive manner, and that it's more important that you be true to yourself and you know be the person that you feel you are and who you want to be and and you know the other stuff will you know sooner or later it's going to go away okay, so when I was reading your your new book, um you know when I was a kid, I tried to make stop action movies and animation and stuff using our home video camera, and it was just impossible. Right. you just couldn't do it. And just looking at how easy it would be with today's technology, I've kind of felt a twinge of like, oh, I'm so jealous, you know, of kids <laughs> who have this stuff. Do you ever, like going through all these projects, did you ever have that kind of thing where you're like, oh, why didn't this, why wasn't this stuff around when I was a kid? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm totally jealous of some of, of, of what the technology allows us to do now. But uh, on the other hand, I'm so excited and happy to be able to play with it now and, and sort of, you know, you always sort of go through with your kids. Well, in my day, I had to hit, uh, you know, 13 key combinations and wait for the processor to catch up before I could print something. And, uh, you know, now they can, you know, send something to a wireless printer off their phone. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I enjoy, I'm a, I'm a total gadget freak and I enjoy whatever is coming next. I can't wait to see what the new stuff is going to do and how far away from, you know, what seems primitive to me from the 70s. Um, Half of the technology we carry with us now was 300-year-away science fiction imagination, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, so speaking of science fiction, uh, uh, what are some of your favorite examples of fantasy and science fiction books? I go back to having been a, a lifelong Arthur Clarke fan, uh, Rendezvous with Rama, Childhood's End. Um, actually, my favorite uh, he he rewrote it later into a novel, but back when it was a, first a novella was uh, City and the Stars, and then I you know a fantasy freak to a huge you know I I think I've read Lord of the Rings twenty or thirty times like I can't remember how many times I've read read the whole series. Um, what else you know Stainless Steel Rat and Callahan books and uh, Philip Jose Farmer and uh, just a little bit of everything. You know, uh, you know, John and I spend a lot of our time reading sort of post-apocalyptic science fiction. And yeah, yeah. do you ever worry that um, that we're all so used to a high technology civilization that if there's any real big disruption to our society, that a critical mass of people don't have the skills to farm and you know stuff like that? 
I think there is that worry, but I also look at it, you know, I mean, how many, how many of us as geeks, and especially as science fiction geeks, um, have all read those stories and thought about what we would do <laughs> in those situations and how we would deal with it? I mean, I'd love to see a movie that was really, you know, what the geeks do after the apocalypse. I, and I, I think what we would run into is, is those of us who are geeks, especially, you know, the maker types and all that stuff, we, we would sit back and go, okay. So that happened, and I can't tweet anyone anymore. That's fine. But you know what? I do still know how to do so much that's fundamental to science and math and, you know, uh, composting, which is totally geeky. You know, there's such a geeky underground garden mu movement with, that goes way beyond composting and, and things like that. I, I, I think the fundamentals are still there, and I especially think that, the uh, the maker side of the geek movement, um, that that stuff is not being lost and it's still being spread, and that the geeks would turn out probably even more than they are now to to be able to lead the charge because we're the people that through you know having read so much and having done so much online to build communities and build databases of information about all this knowledge and and because we all know science. Um, you know, we would do just fine. We'd probably, you know, be able to help lead everybody from despair and chaos and anarchy to a subsistence culture and, and start building back off of that again. Okay. And finally, just are there any other projects that you're working on or anything else coming up that you'd like to mention? There is the possibility that there might be a Geek Dad movie. Huh. Huh. And th this is nuts, and it's it's so completely amazing that it's even a possibility that I I, I still pinch myself. But um, there there are some people in the Hollywood that are, are interested in the idea of Geek Dad as a high concept, some sort of a a uh, sort of family adventure, a la like Spy Kids or something. <laughs> And so there is there is work being done on that. There is actually an IMDb entry for Geek Dad right now, so we're waiting to see what if anything happens to that. And uh, I am actually busy at work on the third Geek Dad book right now that may come out in time for Christmas, and uh, that one will probably all be uh, projects or uh, experiments for science fairs. All right, great. Well, Ken Denby, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Happy to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Ken Denmead for joining us on the show. Okay, and so for our discussion today, we're going to be talking about the issue of whether we're all living in a uh, computer-generated simulation. Uh, this is something, the reason this is kind of, kind of came up recently for me is that I was just watching the 2011 Isaac Asimov Memorial Debate. And so, uh, so I was watching that, and uh, it was moderated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who we interviewed uh, and in one of our recent episodes. And so one of the guys uh, on this panel says something that really struck me. Uh, this, this fellow is, uh, is named Jim Gates, and he's a, a theoretical physicist with a PhD from MIT. And uh, he is a professor of physics at the University of Maryland College Park. And so there's a part, you know, in this uh, panel where Neil deGrasse Tyson asks him sort of where his uh, recent work has taken him. And Jim Gates uh, puts some pictures up uh, on the you know on the screen, and he says, "These are pictures of equations. What I have come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all of the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. When you then try to understand these pictures, you find that buried in them are computer codes, just like the kind you find in a browser when you go search the web. And so I, I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not." And Neil deGrasse Tyson says. So you're saying that as you dig deeper, you find computer code written in the fabric of the cosmos. And Jim Gates says, computer code, yes. Strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not even just is computer code. It's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a computer scientist called Claude Shannon in the 1940s. Um, so, so that's pretty striking. I mean, uh, you know, obviously the idea that we might be living in a computer simulation or some sort of simulation is, is kind of an old idea. But that was the first thing I've seen where somebody sort of was talking about actual empirical evidence uh, that tends to point in that direction. Unfortunately, he didn't say a, that what I just read you is pretty much all he said. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've sort of thought about with this topic is that other things that sort of seem to 
uh, to make you inclined to believe it, not necessarily evidence of code or whatnot, but like when you have like a string of good luck or something, or when when, when things just so, sort of seem to line up for you, it, it's the sort of thing that would make people like, uh, like thank God or something. But, you know, like being an atheist, I, I wouldn't do that. But that's that's sort of a way you can thank God without actually believing in a deity is like, oh, well, you know, there it's possible that this uh, this simulation um, is sort of I guess it's sort of a, a solipsistic view of uh, of of living in the simulation is that, like you know, that that reality is sort of conforming to my wishes or whatever. You know, uh, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, not I'm not suggesting that that's what's that's what's uh, happening or anything, but. Because I have always been a sort of, um, you know, philosophical naturalist and have just believed that, you know, the that there are just laws of nature and that the universe isn't different to our existence and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but then if you consider that we're living in a computer simulation, uh, you're still looking at things from a naturalistic, you know, materialist point of view. But you actually get a lot of, the, like, like you're sort of getting at, you actually get a lot of the implications of religious uh, mm -hmm. teachings, like like an afterlife. I mean, uh mm -hmm. Because I, because I would kind of like to like to not die, um, hmm. but I just I just don't believe in a soul or, or uh, you know anything like that. So so my my sort of my 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 holdouts for, for 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 hope for not dying have kind of been you know that medical technology in my lifetime will advance you know uh, to the point where it'll sort of prolong my life uh, you know keeping me sort definitely of, yeah sort of well keeping me above the curve so that each mm -hmm. you know technological advance extends my life long enough to see the next technological advance which extend, extends my life etc uh, right. i think that's really unlikely uh you know for... actually i mean I've, I've actually heard um or I've, I've seen research that indicates that medical science is actually advancing at a rate that you know people like you know of our generation could actually expect it to you know keep ahead of keep us ahead of that curve yeah, it's it's possible. I I I don't really believe. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a little skeptical too. I, I I'm more I'm more inclined to believe that we'd be just like a little bit too old. Yeah, yeah. For that to work out. Yeah, I'd believe it a lot more. You know, for you know people born a hundred years from now or two hundred years from now. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, who knows? But so that I mean, that's that's one thing. It's not entirely beyond the realm of possibility. And then maybe you know the other things. Maybe super advanced aliens might show up. You know, with with some uh, longevity treatments for us. Obviously, that's kind of a long shot too. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then, and then, well, maybe if we're living in a computer simulation, maybe, you know, our minds will just get, you know, we'll, we'll just wake up in some, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Sort of like chat, chat room, you know, like if you're playing a, a MMO, you know, and we'll find that the whole thing has just been a game and, you know, it's on to the next, uh, next life or something. Um, like as, like as extends, uh, <laughs> ex extends, how, 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 however the hell you say that the name of that movie. Because it, it's like it's like existence with the Z, but they actually pronounce it differently, don't they? I, I don't remember how they pronounce it in the movie. Uh, yeah. I, I would just say existence or something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, there were a whole bunch of. Well, it, I thought it was interesting actually that um, that this guy Jim Gates he uses the Matrix as an example of you know the idea of the world being a an illusion of a you know a sort of computer simulation and. You know, the Matrix is so popular that you don't even have to explain the idea mm -hmm. really to people anymore. Just, you know, the general public. You could just say, oh, you know, like the Matrix. And they kind of, oh, they're like, oh, yeah, I saw that. You know, the, the Matrix, it, it's not actually really a completely a computer simulation. I mean, well, you know, one way that people imagine this working is assuming that sort of computer code can create self-awareness. Then, you know, the world and everyone in it could just be uh, strings of ones and zeros or, or whatever, uh just purely digital or just purely sort of mechanical uh, information. And there's some problem, you know, that might not be technically possible, but then the other possibility would be something more like in the matrix where we're all, you know, we have um, physical brains, um, but the, uh, you know, nerve, uh, nerve endings and, and stuff are all plugged into uh, a machine to, to feed us, uh, you know, sort of fake uh, uh, stimuli. So, I mean, you know, could be either of those, I guess, yeah, I guess if you mention you mentioned this, this movie existence, uh, it actually, you know, it occurred to me that around the time The Matrix came out, you know, The Matrix came out in 1999, and there were a whole bunch of movies, like, right around that time that sort of presented this idea that somebody living in what seems to be our world discovers that he's actually inside a computer simulation uh, mm -hmm. or some sort of, you know, fake... Um, fake reality. Manipulated reality, yeah. Um, so just a couple examples that came to mind, right? We have The Matrix in Existence. We have The 13th Floor... We mm -hmm. have uh, Open Your Eyes, which was remade into Vanilla Sky, mm -hmm. uh, and Dark City. All of those were all between 1997 and 1999. 
And there's the Truman Show as well, which is around that time. I, I think maybe it's a little bit later, but yeah. So um, I don't know. What did you? What do you think of all, of those movies? Just generally, uh, kind of. What's your impression of them? Um, I I hate Dark City, and I know that's an unpopular opinion. Uh, a lot of people seem to regard it very highly, but I don't know. I've, honestly, I didn't know that it was one of those movies because I've never made it to the end of it. I, I can't get more than 10 or 15 minutes into it. I, I just hate it. But um, I really like Open Your Eyes. Um, you know, Vanilla Sky I thought was an okay remake, but, you know, it's got Tom Cruise in it, so that kind of makes it lose points. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, I, I thought the main story of Open Your Eyes was actually quite good, and I enjoyed that. I don't know that I've ever actually seen the 13th floor. I think I may have uh, watched part of it, but I don't really remember it. So I, I can't comment on that. But um, I mean, you know, in The Matrix, I mean, uh, speaking of unpopular opinions, uh, <laughs> you know, as you know, I, I'm not a big fan of The Matrix. Um, and, you know, not even not even bothering to talk about the uh, volumes two and three, which have their own issues, I guess, even among the fan, the fanboys. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I never even really warmed up to the first Matrix. I mean, I, I think it has like a lot of, uh, everything about it that's cool um, doesn't have anything to do with like the science fiction aspects of it. I don't think. I mean, it's like you know all the all the kung fu stuff and everything, and the look of it and everything. It's like, oh, that's cool. But like all the science fiction elements, I felt like it just like it's too much of a mess um, to really work properly, and and so that made me that sort of kept me from enjoying it. Um, and how about Existence? What you what you think of that one? Yeah, that one too is like I, you know, it was again, it was a cool concept and everything, but I mean, I, I don't, I can't say that I really enjoyed the movie, um, and and it's another one that I think uh, is pretty highly regarded um, among science fiction and fantasy fans, but I just, I never, it, it didn't really work for me, um, and that one I don't remember as well, so I can't really, I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint why uh, per se. I mean, I, I could go on and on about the Matrix uh, uh, and my problems with it, but. I mean, Existence, I thought some of the sort of David Cronenberg body horror kind of stuff was kind of cool. There's like a, mm -hmm. a gun that fires teeth or something like that. Um, but um, sort of my issue with it is that we're, we find out at the end that this has all been a game. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like a really boring game, you know. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's supposed to have been created by this sort of genius game designer. And just based on what we've seen in the movie, it just doesn't seem like it's all that interesting or all that fun. Uh, I did find the ending. I, I, you know, the ending is a little corny, but it's it's weirdly memorable. I've, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I find myself thinking about it at, at odd times. Well, actually, by the way, uh, just for anyone listening, um, yeah, uh, if you're worried about spoilers, like it's really kind of impossible to talk about this topic without like spoiling these things for you. So, you know, because since since the whole reveal is that you know that you turn out to be living in a simulation or whatever, that's kind of a, a you know, important factor in, in, in the story. So uh, it's, you know, by the fact that we're telling you that that's what these things are about, it kind of ruins part of it, uh, at least for a lot of these things. So just, you know, be warned. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly true of the 13th floor. Um, mm -hmm. I think the 13th floor really suffered from coming out around the same time as The Matrix. Uh, right. Because, uh, you know, The Matrix essentially did everything interesting about the 13th floor, uh, but did it, you know, but had the Kung Fu and stuff too. Mm -hmm. There is one really cool shot in the, in the 13th floor where the guy first discovers that he's living in a in a computer simulation uh where he sort of he sort of gets gets hints about it and he drives out of the city in which he lives and drives out into the countryside and the countryside just sort of ends and beyond that is just or it's just kind of uh green grid work lines uh stretching out beyond that and uh, I've always mm -hmm. thought that was a really cool uh, a really cool visual image. I actually really like Dark City. I could see why you wouldn't like it, especially if you only watched the first. What did you say? The first twenty minutes or something? <laughs> yeah, like I, I don't remember. I didn't get very far into it. I, I, you know, I, I know I didn't like it when I first tried to watch it, and then like people had been saying how awesome it was, and so like I went back to it like a couple years ago after you know, so you know, sort of after I had developed uh, more, you know, more critical faculties and whatever because you know I was a little bit older and um and I yeah I still didn't get it. You know, I mean I didn't couldn't get into it at all. So. I mean, like the like the characterization's not great, and it's a little over the top. But it, as it, as it goes, it just builds this really sort of spooky, spookily effective uh, mood. You know, the, the the premise basically is that there's this guy, and he wakes up, I think, in a bathtub, and uh, you know, doesn't know who he is, and he's in this sort of city where it's night, and um, it turns out that in this city there are these kind of guys and sort of creepy corpse looking guys in black trench coats who go around with syringes injecting false memories into people so uh you know at, at midnight or something every 
you know, every time the clock goes around, everybody just sort of falls into a coma. And then these guys in trench coats come around and they move buildings around and reshape rooms and change the clothing that people are wearing. And then they inject them with these memories. And so then the people wake up thinking that they're, you know, with this whole mem memories of a, an entirely different life. And, uh, and this, this, uh, and the protagonist has somehow, uh, gotten knocked out of this system. And so he can see, uh, that all of this is going on. And, uh, like there's a, there's a part where he, uh, you know, he meets this detective who's been investigating, uh, the city and, uh, has sort of gone mad and, and says that there's no, uh, you know, there's no way out that it never ends that, uh, and there's this, this constant imagery of, uh, of a sort of a, a rat in a maze. So in, yeah, in terms of, there's some problems with the execution, but the conceptually it's very, very interesting and it has a, a absolutely terrific ending. Uh, I guess while we're here, let's, we might as well have it out on, on the matrix. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, Cause I like I like the matrix. I mean, there's some issues with it, but I, I think it's a mm -hmm. great movie. So what, what, what's, what's your problem with the matrix? Uh, well, I mean, I just think, uh, I think a lot of the, the science, uh, the scientific, the science fictional um, conceits to it like they just don't make sense when you start when you think about them like I mean like you know they the idea that the so like uh, I mean so that the AIs would like you know use humans as batteries or whatever to like to power their shit or whatever like that's, <laughs> you know, that seemed pretty stupid and uh, like uh, and, and you know like one of the things that like really annoyed the, sh the crap out of me was uh, let's see oh I guess Neo got knocked out or something and then so Trinity like goes to like kiss him to like wake him up or whatever and like he wakes up like what like that is so fucking cheesy like I just like I couldn't even stand it like I was like on my first watch through like in the theater I was like I was like ugh you know just like I just couldn't take it it was like so terrible you know uh, oh one of the other things I really had that really annoyed me is the is the whole thing with the with that prophet or whatever with the 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 woman baking the cookies yeah yeah. yeah. Like I didn't like I didn't like the scene at all. You know, I mean, like I didn't, I didn't like the way it was portrayed. I didn't like the idea of the scene to begin with. And okay, well, I'm actually with you 100 percent on all those things you just said. I mm -hmm. mean, those are definitely you know. Well, I'm, I'm only with you like 85 percent on the Oracle, but I'm, I'm with yeah, you 100 100 yeah. percent on the other two things. Mm -hmm. But those are like it seems like those are such like short parts of the movie. I mean, you yeah. know, there's like the the thing with the humans as batteries is dumb, but it's like a short. It's like five seconds of backstory. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Neo kissing or um, Trinity kissing him to wake him up or bring him back to life or whatever. That's dumb. But that's just, you know, that's like one thing that happens at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just seems like there's so much cool stuff that happens. Yeah, I don't know. I might I might irrationally like, you know, dislike it for uh, for, for those reasons. You know, I mean, I, uh, it, might, it might it might not actually be reasonable that I, that I dislike it so much based on those things. And I mean, and, it, and there might be like a bunch of other little things that I'm not thinking of right now that sort of all added up to make me, you know, dislike it as much as I did. I mean, I think at least part of it, part of what uh, disappointed me about it so much is that like it really had I thought it had the I thought it had a lot of potential to be like a brilliant science fiction film, right? But then there's like a bunch of things that that keep it from being that. And, and so, like, maybe it, maybe it's like, um, you know, me sort of disliking it for not being what I wanted it to be rather than, you know, evaluating for what it actually is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, given that you dislike The Matrix and Dark City, um, that you, you say that, that you're sort of um, anomalous in, in how much you, you dislike them. Do, do you mm -hmm. think you might have some, do you have any issue with just the basic idea of the world turning out to be a simulated reality that kind of bugs you or... I mean, well, I mean, the idea of it being that in in actual reality that would kind of bug me, but um, you know, in, in, as far as a, uh, as a plot device in fiction, I don't have a problem with it per se. Um, you know, like I I, I liked Open Your Eyes, um, and uh, and actually uh, one of the other things I was going to bring up is uh, is uh, there's this uh, there's this novel called Idlewild by Nick Sagan, um, Carl Sagan's son. So that one uh, I thought it, it has a pretty inventive use of it. Um, where uh and i mean it's it's kind of spoilerish to say that but i mean it's like it happens in the first book and it's like the first half of the first book so it's not the ending but um you know basically the story takes place in a post-apocalyptic uh earth and basically like there's only like i think like eight people left on earth but they're they were they were all like um put into sort of like a a simulation so um so that they could uh grow up they can grow up in safety and learn all the skills that they would need to like sort of rebuild uh, the world uh, after this. Cause there, there was like a, like a big plague um, that like wiped out almost everyone. And so they're, they're being raised in the simulation and, and like, they don't know that they're in a simulation, but then at some point, you know, things break down and they have to, you know, go out into the actual real world. 
Um, and so, I, I mean, I thought it was pretty well done in there. And, uh, and I mean, I have some other examples too. And um, uh, unfortunately, some of them, like, I don't know that I want to ruin them by saying that, that they belong to this genre um, because, you know, like it kind of does ruin it because it, like it just comes in at the end. Um, but other things that I think are like more widely known, like, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm like a big Star Trek The Next Generation fan. And, you know, so uh, some of the holodeck episodes kind of deal with this a little bit. But I mean, one in particular, there's there's one called Ship in a Bottle. And, you know, if anybody who's seen Next Generation, you'll remember this episode. It's, um, you know, uh, like Data, the android, you know, he goes in uh, the holodeck and he has any, 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 he, he plays with this uh, Sherlock Holmes simulation where, you know, he's playing Sherlock Holmes and some of the other characters play other characters. And so at some point he encounters Professor Moriarty. Um, and so that was like in one episode and, and, you know, they have some, you know, there's, there's some plot arc that happens and then it ends and, and then, you know, he, and then that's done. But then, so in this, in this second episode, uh, ship in a bottle, uh, the Moriarty um, simulation um, becomes self-aware and then so he starts doing um he starts sort of accessing the 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 holodex computer and everything and and then and so he learns that he's living in a simulation so i mean it's kind of a, a different take on it but i mean it's like you know so he's a simulation that develop, that that actually discovers that he's living in a simulation there was a, a a next generation episode i remember really vividly where um dr crusher kind of is going around the ship and people are disappearing and nobody seems to remember any of the people who've disappeared yeah, so like, uh, you know, it starts out and, you know, I forget, one of the characters has disappeared, you know, and like Worf, say, for example. And uh, and she says, you know, where's, where's Worf? And people are like, Worf who? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's kind of freaking her out. And, and she's going around to people trying to figure out what's going on. And more and more people are disappearing off of the ship. And, you know, every time, every time you know, nobody remembers that none of the people on, who, are, who remain remember any of the people who have disappeared. And it gets to the point where, you know, there's like her and two other people left on the ship. And she's like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would we be out here on this gigantic ship with just mm -hmm. the three of us? You know, and they're just like, you know, they have some self-consistent rationalization for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it gets to the point where it's just, you know, everyone has dis disappeared except her. And, uh, you know, she's talking to the ship's computer and, you know, she says, you know, <laughs> explain this to me. How can I be the only crew member aboard this entire, you know, Federation, Federation starship? So what was actually going on? Uh, so, oh, well, actually, at one point, sh at some point before the end of the episode, you see like the ship with all the crew people, you know, all the normal crew people still on it, and they're trying to figure out what's happened to her. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, through some Star Trek, you know, techno babble mumbo jumbo, she had somehow found herself transported into sort of like a pocket universe. And the thing that had been on her mind, like right right at the beginning of the episode somebody had retired or something and she had said, it just seems like everybody's disappearing these days. Mm -hmm. And so somehow she had, you know, I mean, it doesn't really make sense, but she had somehow trans found, found herself transported into a pocket universe where that state of mind was sort of, you know, became the um, overriding reality for the whole universe that she was in. Yeah, actually that reminds me, um, there's, there's another, there's yet another next generation episode. This one doesn't deal with the holodeck or anything either, but, um, uh, the Enterprise encounters this like probe out in space, and uh, it, it like sort of it shoots this beam into at the ship, and it and it sort of like strikes Picard on the bridge, and and he like passes out, um, and he wakes up, and he's like on this other world. He finds himself on this other world, and and it's like he has a family there and, and children and and everything, and, and and they all know him, but he doesn't know who they are. He thinks he's Jean Luc Picard, you know, of the Enterprise, um, but they all know him as somebody else, and uh, so. You know, he sort of goes about trying to figure out what's going on. And at some point he he uh, you know, they all they convince him basically that he was crazy, that, you know, that the Enterprise is 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 something out of his imagination and that, you know, he's this other guy. And, and so he goes he goes about his life basically at, at, at that point and he just like sort of lives his life. And and so by by the end of the episode, it sort of is revealed that that this probe was put in space by this race that has had been dying. And then you sort of see some of that on, uh, on the surface with Picard when he's, uh, when he's living this other life, you see that their world is dying. And so um, the, the, this race put the probe in space because their race was dying and um, they sort of inserted memories into his mind. And so basically like he like lived this whole life, like in his mind, like in the span of like, you know, like five minutes or something. So like he passed out and he was out for five minutes. And then, but then like, he like lives this whole life, you know, in this sort of imagined reality. 
um, that was, uh, you know, sort of put in there by the probe. And and then so but then so he wakes up and he still remembers it because like it, it was there was this great scene like um, in the, when he was living this other life, he was like he, he like learned to play this flute thing. Um, and then so like you sort of the episode ends like he, he's back. He wakes up back on the bridge and, um, you know, and then so he sort of replicates one of those flutes and, he, and you know, they show him playing it. So um, so like it was real, you know, I mean, he like really mm-hmm. like sort of lived that in his mind. Yeah. And, and but episodes like that, there's always the problem that, you know. You know he's not yeah. crazy, right? It's not like they're right. going to change the whole format of the show where he's now this guy who just was imagining that he used to be right. in the Enterprise. Right, right. Um, which is kind of too bad. I mean, that you you know, that you know have that sort of certainty. You know, it would, it would be kind of, you know, it would be kind of interesting if you could watch a show where they might just, you know, it might turn out four seasons into it that the Starship Captain is just crazy. He never <laughs> was a Starship Captain. And then the rest of the show is about his some other mm-hmm. life he has, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was asking earlier if you had a problem with the the idea of you know the world turning out to be a like virtual reality simulation, whatever. I mean, it, I, I can I, I can sort of anticipate an objection to it, which is that I mean, it's sort of taken for granted these days that to end a story with it was all a dream. Yeah, it's just a really mm-hmm. bad way to end a story. Mm-hmm. And I can at least see someone making the argument that ending a story with nothing you saw actually happened; it was all part of a simulation is sort mm-hmm. of veering dangerously close to that it was all a dream. Mm-hmm. sort of thing um and That's i true. and i mean i think that you know and sort of like the longer i think it's fine in sort of like a feature length movie that it can all turn out to have been a a simulation or something at the end but mm-hmm. you know i think i think we would really resist that in a you know in like season three of a television show mm-hmm. um it was kind of the same thing with lost um it wasn't exactly vr but um there was this episode of lost that i was actually one of my favorite episodes of lost called dave you know, it's 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 been established that Hurley used to be in a mental institution, mm-hmm. and uh, that there was this guy Dave that he knew when he was in the mental institution, and so on the island, Hur- um, Dave shows up and uh, tells Hurley that he's still in the mental institution, and that everything oh, right. that everything mm-hmm. you know everything that he remembers about the plane crash and and the island uh, is all just like stuff that he's hallucinating because uh, he's just had this complete mental breakdown, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and Dave is able to offer some some plausible sounding arguments. For example, you know, Hurley has struck up this semi romantic friendship with this attractive woman, Libby. And Dave says, "Come on, obviously this is just something you're fantasizing. You think in real life that this woman would have any interest in you, <laughs> you know?" Mm-hmm. And you're watching that episode. You're like, "Yeah, that is actually a pretty good point." Mm-hmm. Uh, and but again, like you know that they're not just gonna, you know, in season three or whatever, it's not just gonna turn out that it was all that Hurley's just crazy and he's been in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. Um, but it would be kind of cool if, you know, if, if they did do something like that. Yeah. You know, actually, I mean, if they hadn't done that in, in that episode, uh, I mean, that was sort of, that was sort of a plausible ending for the show. Right. I mean, you know, it would have made as much sense as what they actually did end the show with. Mm -hmm. I guess actually, you know, I mean, like an author who, uh, who dealt a lot with, you know, the idea of the reality that you see turning out to be fake, uh, you know, obviously it was Philip K. Dick. Um, mm-hmm. who I think a lot of these things that we've been mentioning, you know, they owe a lot to, to his stories actually in, uh, existence, there's this shot of, uh, uh, like a, a bag from a food restaurant called Perky Pats. And that's, you know, a, a direct reference to, uh, to Philip K. Dick's novel, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, mm-hmm. um, which, uh, is a really, really creepy book. This is, a, it's a book actually, it's, it's so disturbing that, uh, I, th- I, I, I think I remember that Philip K. Dick wrote this book and then he was like too afraid. He was too disturbed by it to ever go back and, you know, read it again after he, after he wrote it. So it didn't get uh, a lot of copy editing or, or mm. anything. But the premise basically is that uh, it's in the future and, uh, you know, Earth is completely ecologically devastated and humanity is spread throughout the solar system and life is just really hard and harsh and you know, requires a lot of hard work and because uh, there's so few resources. And so people's only uh, sort of escape is to take a drug uh, called Candy, which is a, a hallucinogen. And so they have these, uh, these sort of basically, they're, they're basically Barbie doll sets and you play with them and then you take this drug. And as long as the drug lasts, you sort of imagine that you are, actually are Barbie and Ken, you know, living these, uh, this idyllic uh, life. But then, of course, you know, the drug wears off and you find yourself back in this horrible future. Mm-hmm. So this this guy named Palmer Eldridge had set off to explore deep space 
uh, you know, years before. And so he returns and it's not clear. He's sort of creepy when he comes back. Like maybe he's, uh, he's been possessed or, you know, maybe it's an alien impersonating him or he's been possessed somehow or something. But so he had, he claims he has a, a much better drug called choosy. Um, and so that's, you know, it's like a thousand times better than candy. And so people start taking choosy and it has sort of the same sort of effect, but choosy essentially, choosy never wears off. And so each time you think it's worn off, you're still inside the hallucination. Mm. And the way that you know that you're still inside the hallucination is that Palmer Eldritch is sort of like God in all of these hallucinations that choosy, you know, brings about. And uh, Palmer Eldritch, you know, the, the title, the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, he has these three features. Uh, he has like, I think, a like a mechanical eye, a mechanical hand and steel teeth, something like that. So, so you'll just be, you know, you think that the drug's worn off and then you just start talking to, you know, the receptionist or something and suddenly realize that she has metal teeth. And mm -hmm. that's in, and suddenly you're like, oh shit, I'm still, I'm still in Palmer Eldritch's, you know, hallucinations. Um, yeah. And I haven't read it or seen the new movie, but, um, someone mentioned that, uh, the adjustment bureau is also, um, along those same lines. Yeah, sort of. I saw that. I mean, it's, oh. it's actually, it's very much like, uh, I don't particularly recommend it, but, uh, it's actually, it's very similar. It's sort of like dark city. It's a very similar premise to dark city. Uh, except, uh, without the interesting stuff, you know? Hmm. Um, but yeah, in that one, uh, it's, it's sort of the same idea that there's these sort of guys in suits who go around, you know, behind the scenes, sort of adjusting things to, uh, as, as part of a weird program or experiment or something. Uh, there's also this, this other Philip K. Dick story I wanted to mention. This is a short story called The Electric Ant, and it's about this guy and he discovers that he's a robot and he opens up his chest and he finds there's sort of this, um... Uh, sort of tape running around in spools inside his chest, you know, like sort of like magne magnetic computer tape and the tape has sort of holes punched in it. And so like everything that he's observing is, uh, you know, being created by, by the whole, you know, what, what, whatever the pattern of holes in this tape is. And so he starts just punching his own holes in the tape and seeing what happens. And every time he does that, it, you know, changes something in his reality. I think like, like doves, you know, like a flock of doves appear or something like that. And so, uh, so that's another one that really kind of messes with your head where, you know, is there anything outside of the, the punched, punched tape that exists and how would you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Tim Pratt has a story called unexpected outcomes. Uh, it was an in inner zone a couple of years ago and then, uh, it's on escape pod as well. Um, in that one, it's, it's like every, it turns out everybody's living in a, in a simulation, but you know, that's the whole point of the story. So it's not a spoiler. Um, but uh, you know, they don't they don't realize it until there's like this visitor that comes and appears to them and, and basically explains to them that like, hey, well, you know, look, we were doing this experiment and we were, you know, but now the experiments run its course. And, and so basically we're going to we're going to let things run down now. So, you know, there's not going to be any more babies. You guys aren't going to need to eat anymore. And and and, you know, all this other you know, there's all these different things because it's like, you know, well, you know, it takes a lot of processing power to run a simulation of this size, you know. Um, and so basically there's it's like. You know, they're just killing the project, so there's going to be like all of these uh, huge ramifications to the world. Um, and you know, like in this in this particular situation, like people weren't real. You know, they didn't have they didn't have like bodies somewhere that were you know that were interacting with the simulation. They were just actually simulations themselves as well. Uh, I mean, actually, speaking of processing power, I came across some interesting you know interesting uh, discussions of that. Um... Actually, I guess we should say that, you know, I think the the discussion of, of the issue of whether we actually live in a computer simulation, the discussion of that that's gotten the most attention that I'm aware of was that was this article by Nick Bostrom um, called Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? Uh, it was published in Philosophical Quarterly in 2003. He makes this 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 argument. This is a pretty interesting argument for, for why, uh, why we might be living in a computer simulation. And, and the argument basically goes that one of these three possibilities must be true. Uh, that one, humanity is very likely to go extinct before we reach uh, a, a really advanced sort of post-human stage of development where we could be creating uh, really advanced simulations. Uh, possibility two is that we'll reach this sort of post-human civilization, but for some reason we won't want to run simulations of our past. And three, if you accept that we will reach the post-human stage of development and will want to run simulations of our past, then the implication of that is that we are almost certainly are living in a computer simulation because, mm. uh, just st statistically speaking, there would be mm. millions, 
you know, or whatever of simulations and only one reality. And that's, I think that's a really interesting argument because it's, uh, I don't actually, I don't really see anything wrong with the logic, but it leads to this, you know, really strange counterintuitive conclusion. And I mean, you could certainly imagine why people would want to create simulations of the past. I mean, you just look at, you know, people play, uh, you know, total war, you know, games mm -hmm. like that, even now, you know, people are constantly creating uh, simulations of the past, even just using the very crude tools that we have available to us right now. Um, but, but actually, you know, you brought, but you brought up this issue, like from, from the Tim Pratt story about feasibility, you know, like how much, uh, mm -hmm. computational power would it take and stuff like that. Uh, I guess I'll just read this. This is a little long, but this is, this is what, uh, Bostrom has to say. It says, uh, Bostrom calculated that simulating the brain functions of all humans who have ever lived would require roughly 10 to the 33rd to 10 to the 36 calculations. He further calculated that a planet-sized computer built using known nanotechnological methods would perform about 10 to the 42nd calculations per second, and a planet-sized computer is not inherently impossible to build, although the speed of light could severely constrain the speed at which its subprocessors share data. Uh, in any case, a simulation need not compute every single molecular event that occurs inside it. It may only process events that its participant, participants can actively perceive. Uh, this is particularly the case if the simulation contained only a handful of people, far less processing power would be needed to make them believe that they were in a world much larger than was actually the case. A real world example of this could be the observer paradox or Heisenberg uncertainty principle. An unobserved region of space is indeterminate until observed. This could be, this could be because the simulating computer is not s simulating it until it needs to. It also points out that, uh, uh, that a simulated reality doesn't need to run in real time. Uh, you know, that, so for us, it might seem that it's running, running in real time, but the simulator might be, it might be taking a year, you know, to, to calculate each second. Mm. Uh, oh, I mean, one, one issue is like, how would we know that we're in a simulation and maybe there would be glitches or bugs and stuff, uh, you know, the kind that, that turn up in games mm -hmm. and, uh, probably, I mean, it, it seems likely that any, you know, civilization that could create such a sophisticated, uh, simulation in the first place could probably keep us from detecting uh, glitches and things. And even if we did, they might just like erase our memories of it uh, so that we never really could uh, determine definitively that we're in a simulation. But uh, another thing is that, you know, since we don't know, you know, if, if we are in a simulation, we don't know what the real world might look like and how, you know, the world that we observe differs from the real world. And, and so an interesting thing it brings up here is it says that, uh, you know, it might be that in the real, you know, that tornadoes, you know, don't actually exist in the real world that, you know, it's a result of a programming bug that air, mm -hmm. you know, forms into tornadoes in our, in our world. Um, mm -hmm. and so someone from the real world who found them, found themselves in our simulation would look at that and see that as a bug, uh, that would give it away. But of course, since we only know the simulation, you know, it just seems, uh, it just seems normal to us and, you know, can't, isn't a clue to us. There were two, I guess there are two, two other stories I wanted to mention. Um, these are unfortunate. I don't remember the names of the stories or the authors. Uh, actually, if anyone, you know, if you, if anyone can tell me what they are, uh, you know, that would be a big help. But, uh, the, the first story, it's about this guy and, uh, he's just miserable. You know, he hates his job. He hates his life. And he's just, he just has this weird intuition that he's an alien being whose, uh, consciousness has been projected into this human body. And he's, he's just convinced that somehow that this is, that he must have done something horrible on his home planet and that he's being punished, um, you know, that his punishment was that he has to live this miserable life on earth. And he just sort of spends his whole life, uh, convinced that that's the case. And so then he dies and he wakes up and finds that he is, uh, you know, actually in, in this alien body and there are attendants around him and he sort of looks at them and he says, what, you know, why? You know, what is it? What did, what did I do that was so horrible that you felt the need to punish me by sending me there? And the attendants all kind of look at each other and, and they say, you know, you, you must be confused from the, from the effects of having your mind, uh, you know, projected, etc. cetera. Uh, you're our most cherished leader. And, uh, we projected you to the pleasure planet where people's lives are a thousand times better than mm -hmm. any of your subjects, you know, enjoy. And this is like the, you know, it took all these resources to do it. And it's just this great honor that we were able to, to give you because you're so important to us. Um, there's also this, this other story. Uh, I think I read it in Asimov's. So I'm not sure this would be back when I was in high school, I think, but it, it's about these scientists and they're, um, running and running an experiment where they've created a simulation, you know, a very high level simulation. And they notice that they're, that the simulation has, uh, 
that the people within the sort of a group of scientists within the simulation have realized that they're in a simulation. And then the scientists realize that they themselves are in a simulation. And then it sort of switches perspective to some scientists observing them that they've just, mm -hmm. you know, they've just realized they're in a simulation, but then those scientists realize that they're also in a simulation. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of goes like that with different groups of scientists, you know, and then sort of circles around back to the first scene so that it's like, you know, this sort of ring of worlds simulating each other. Yeah, I've actually read that. Uh, I can't think of what it is, though. Uh, I read it actually fairly recently, too. Does does it sound like Jeff Landis sounds right for that? I, I read it. I mean, I read it so long ago, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Is it called Ouroboros? Oh, no, that would be a good title for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it says, uh, this story involves the idea that the beings in the simulation run a computer program in which another universe is simulated and so on. The story concludes with the scary implications of what it would mean if this chain looped back on itself so that eventually this universe is itself running on a computer in one of the universes that it, it is simulating. All right. Hey, one down, one down, one to go. Nice. Yeah. Because we're talking about this topic, I kind of feel like we have to at least mention Inception, um, which is, uh, you know, it's not, not quite um, the same thing because, you know, it's dealing with dreams instead of uh, simulated reality. But, I mean, it kind of deals with the, a lot of similar concepts because, like, when you're in a dream, you don't necessarily know that you're in a dream. Yeah, and, and some of the articles I was reading was making the point about how hard it would be to detect that we're in a simulation, you know, that if our... You know, if our brains can go into a state where we don't realize that we're dreaming while we're asleep, mm -hmm. how easy would it be to use a similar sort of mechanism mm -hmm. to keep us from realizing that we're in a simulation, you know, if, if, it, if it came to that? That actually kind of reminds me, there was this really cool Ursula K. Le Guin novel uh, called The Lathe of Heaven, mm -hmm. um, which, which seems pretty uh, pertinent uh, to this discussion. But the, the premise of that is that there's a guy... And every time he goes to sleep and dreams, he finds that the, the entire world has changed to somehow conform to what he had dreamed. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, is afraid to he's afraid to sleep because he doesn't want the world to keep changing. So he's sort of been uh, drugging himself him, drugging himself not to dream. And uh, and so he comes to the attention of the authorities um, and sort of falls into the uh, <sighs> clutches of this uh, megalomaniacal therapist. Who's, who sees in, immediately that he can use this guy to try to remake the world into a better place. And he has a kind of machine that'll sort of by hypnotic suggestion or something influence what this guy is going to dream about. And so he tries to use this guy to, to dream about a better world, but it never quite works. And so, uh, you know, um, I, I remember one of the first things he tries is he wants, he tells him, he sort of suggests that the guy dream about a world without racism. And then mm -hmm. when the guy wakes up, just everyone on earth is, is sort of this weird gray color. <laughs> and then uh, he wants him to dream, to dream about world peace. And, uh, and so then the, when the guy wakes up, earth is at peace, but they're at peace because they're united against this alien, these alien invaders uh, mm. who never existed before. And so it's kind of like one of those like leprechaun wish kind of things where it, uh, there's, there's always this, un these unintended consequences. Okay. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. If anyone you know thinks they uh, have something to add, definitely go and watch this uh, you know 2011 Isaac Asimov Memorial Lecture and uh, let me know what you think about the stuff that they discuss. And also, if you go to Nick Bostrom's, Nick, Nick Bostrom has a site about uh, about all this stuff. Just type in uh, you know Are you living in a computer simulation? And there's all sorts of articles there. And if anyone wants to go read more about this and you know post uh, what you conclude, uh, I'd be really interested to hear it. And if you have any, and if you have any evidence uh, that we are living in a simulation, and you know how to give us access to those cool matrix powers, let, <laughs> like you know, let us know. Okay, and so you know, we're uh, as always, we're sponsored by Audible.com. So if you want to go to our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on any of the ads for Audible and sign up for a trial subscription, uh, you'll get a free audiobook that would uh, really help us out. And one book you might want to check out is they just released uh, a new translation of Stanislaw Lem's Solaris. This is apparently the first translation ever where it's directly Polish to English. So it's, uh, you know, unabridged. It's a sort of definitive translation. Uh, sounds very cool. So uh, check that out. And, you know, if you do it by going to geeksguideshow.com, you know, uh, you would be helping us out a lot. Uh, and, you know, also another way you can help us out is uh, you can also go to our website at geeksguideshow.com and you can click on the PayPal button. You can uh, donate some money there. Um, and, or if you don't want to spend any money, um, you can, um, 
in addition to clicking on the Audible ads, you can also just go to iTunes and help spread the word by um, by giving us a review or rating um, over there. Like if it's a nice five star rating or write us a little review. Um, and, uh, you know, other than that, you know, tell a friend. All right. Well, so thanks, everyone, for joining us and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of io9. For this episode's show notes, to subscribe to this podcast, or for more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.